Welcome to the Asia Climate Finance Podcast, where we discuss climate action related business, finance, and investment topics, including issues around clean, green, net zero emissions, and sustainable energy, as well as climate, environmental, green, and sustainable finance. Hi there, and thank you for joining the 31st episode of the Asia Climate Finance Podcast. I am your host. Joseph Giacobelli. Today we talk about the circular economy. Now, a circular economy transforms goods nearing the end of their useful life into resources for reuse. It aids climate change in three ways. It complements decarbonization measures. It supports the sustainable scaling of the clean energy transition. And it enhances adaptation to a changing climate. The value creation opportunity is 4.1 4.1 trillion US dollars, according to one estimate. Our guest is Ellen Martin, who is the chief impact officer of private equity firm Circular Capital. Now, she is greatly invested in investing in this space. And in the podcast, she first provides some background on the circular economy in general and plastic circularity in particular, and how it ties in with climate action. She also describes the investable market as well as government policy and regulation. From the perspective of private equity, we then dive into the business and investment opportunities in the Asia region, including a discussion on the types of investors, as well as some examples of circulate capital's investments. Please listen to the disclaimer at the end of the show and please enjoy the show. So as mentioned, this is episode 31 of the Asia Climate Finance Podcast. And today we're talking about a very, very interesting subject, the circular economy. And, um, you know, how do you invest in it? How do you make money in it? And our guest today is Ellen Martin. Good afternoon, Ellen. How are you today? Hi, Joseph. Great to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks. Hope that the weather down in Singapore is not, uh, not too rainy, not too hot, and not too humid. But uh, <laughs> um, it is all of those things. <laughs> all of those things at the same time. So, Ellen, um, you know, again, thank you so much for making the time today. I really appreciate it. And usually, you know, we start with uh, asking our guest about, uh, you know, her or his background, not so much as a, you know, CV or bio, but more so that, um, you know, listeners can understand how did you get to where you are today and potentially, you know, for um, young people who want to get into this business or people who want to reinvent themselves, you know, how, how to get to, to where you are today. So uh, could we please start with your journey? Sure. That sounds great. So um, let's see. I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My parents were small business owners in America. Um, my mom emigrated there from Taiwan in the 1960s. Uh, And my first real job was actually as a teacher, but I spent most of my career working at the intersection of business and impact. After business school, I worked for an impact strategy consulting firm that was co-founded by Harvard economist Michael Porter, where um, I worked with Fortune 500 companies to play a more meaningful and impactful role in social and environmental issues, but to do so in a way that plays to their competitive advantage and business strategy. Um, And then I helped them measure their impact. So I uh, was a generalist for many years and then found my passion for the circular economy at Closed Loop Partners, a firm that invests in recycling infrastructure and ventures in the United States. And there I led impact and strategic initiatives. Mm -hmm. So so initially you got into the impact impact investment. Very interesting. How long ago, not not, not to reveal too many secrets, but uh, how many years ago was that? So I started working at Closed Loop in 2016 and was wow. there for okay. three years, yeah. So just just uh, just as the Paris Treaty was uh, was being ratified and signed by everybody, and uh, so quite early days. Um, exactly. Excuse my curiosity. Um, and, and can we talk about what you're doing right now in uh, yes. Singapore, Ellen? Absolutely. So um, maybe just to pick up the thread, in my work at Closed Loop, I think I realized that we were never really going to solve the circular economy challenge by just working within a single market, even one as big as the United States. Um, plastics and you know many other scrap materials are global commodities. 
And if you ignore the influences of policy change or consumer behavior that's happening, even if it's halfway around the world, it's a risk to the impact. Um, so I leaned into that challenge. I became chief impact officer at Circulate Capital, which at the time was just starting up, and moved to Singapore. And, and, and what, what is Circulate Capital? Obviously, it's a, it's a derivation of uh, the circular economy, I'm guessing. Um, but could you tell us a little bit more about uh, Circulate, Circulate Capital? Absolutely. Uh, so Circulate Capital is um, uh, the leading circular economy investment management firm that focuses in high growth and emerging markets. It uh, started in 2018, uh, really on the back of the ocean plastics challenge and uh, the crisis that was just becoming part of uh, the broader awareness and identifying Asia as the top region where this issue was particularly coming to, to light. So Circulate partners with global brands and private investors to scale solutions to address these challenges, catalyze systems change in a linear value chain across the world. I can talk more about that in a bit. Um, but our financing creates more circular plastic supply chains. So we're really delivering competitive financial returns and positive impact at scale. Today we have uh, about $175 million under management and have so far deployed about 60 million in South and Southeast Asia primarily. And, you know, amongst our uh, LPs in the first fund, the Ocean Fund, we have eight of the world's largest consumer brands and companies in the plastics value chain. So they play a critical role in what we're doing. And uh, soon after we launched that fund, we started raising our second fund, which also includes investment from DFIs and family offices, many of which are in Asia. And I lead Impact in ESG. So my responsibility is um, really to ensure that our investment strategies and our relationships deliver the impact as we scale. And I sit on our leadership team and our investment team. And, and just to, to, to cross the T's and dot the I's, as an investment manager, uh, you mean direct investment into companies as opposed to public equities or, or bonds or stuff like that, right? That's right. Cool. Cool. Um, so that, that that that's great. So we've we've got a little bit about your you know your your personal background and current role, um, little profile on circular capital. But could we um, get a little a little bit deeper in terms of background and discuss perhaps you know what what exactly we're talking about about the circular economy? I think everybody come has come across the term, but may not be that that familiar with it. About the investable market. Um, about um, you know some so some of the regulation because obviously you know policy is quite is quite key. So could we start with um, perhaps some background on what exactly is a circular economy in general and plastic circularity in particular, uh, and also perhaps could you explain how it ties in with climate action? Yeah, circular economy offers an alternative to traditional linear economy that the world's accustomed to. The take resources. Uh, extract them from the earth, make something with it, and then at the end of its life, uh, dump it or waste it. It seeks to really reduce or eliminate waste um, from the beginning, recover resources at the end of a product's life cycle, and then channel them back into an ecosystem to maximize value and thus significantly reducing pressure on the environment and on the world's resources. So the adoption of the circular approach really requires transformation of the entire value chain. Um, and I would argue multiple value chains um, mm -hmm. from production and consumption to waste and resource management. And there's not just one technology or business model that can do it. It's really systems change and a whole suite of different solutions that we need to be thinking about. In the plastics value chain in particular, uh, we need to see this happen uh, if we're going to indeed see significant impact on climate as well. Um, and those solutions include downstream solutions, which would mean you know, sort of post-consumption, managing plastic that maybe already is present in the environment, creating a closed loop for products like, um, you know, water bottles, beverage containers, and other consumer packaging, recovering that material and recycling it to new items over multiple life cycles. It also includes upstream innovations. So if we think about fundamentally how we 
rethink products and services, how they're designed, new business models, alternative materials that get us away from virgin plastic, that curb in plastic production and waste and that you know, vicious cycle is really critical to being able to solve the issue from an impact perspective. And every step of that life cycle, we see greenhouse gas emissions, uh, impact on climate, plastic pollution, they're all interconnected in terms of stresses on the environment. One estimate assumes that plastics, the plastic life cycle as it is in a linear economy contributes 1.8 gigatons in a single year, which is tremendous. If it were a country, it would be the fourth largest GHG emitter. Mm. And then in the absence of interventions, emissions from the plastics life cycle are projected to more than double to over four gigatons by 2060, representing almost 5% of global emissions. It's a big issue. Mm, 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 mm. Pretty massive. In terms of an investable market, um, you know, how big is the circular economy? I mean, uh, you know, when circular capital decided to get into this space, what 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 kind of investable market um, in in dollar terms or other terms did you did you kind of assess? Yeah, great question. Um, the truth is that the data is not great. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had to define, you know, it's not like you can go to PitchBook or you know a database and click a filter that says circular economy and you get a nice answer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's been estimated that the global capital demand for Circular solutions in the plastic space in particular is estimated at 1.2 trillion. And that is roughly $27 billion a year just in emerging markets. And that would include everything from waste management and recovery of plastics to recycling and new technologies and alternative materials and reuse and refill and, and all of that. Um, private capital in Asia is a little bit more transparent as we discovered uh, through some research that was done by our affiliated nonprofit, the Circulate Initiative recently. Mm. Um, it's, we've seen in Asia about three and a half billion invested in the past five years. Mm. So we do have a bit of data there, but for us, there's a real challenge because there's a lack of transparency. We don't see much track record and therefore not a lot of other investors in this space, but we know that the need is there, the demand is there, and the overall investable space is, is quite significant. Our pipeline has never been thin uh, mm. in the markets that we're investing in, in Asia, and I think that's especially true when we look at downstream solutions, which solve some of those near-term challenges with plastics uh, in the environment that need to be managed. Uh, Ellen, is, also, is there also def uh, a definition and taxonomy issue as to, you know, maybe circulate capital will include X in the definition, but then, you know, another company will not. So is there also a taxonomy and how is that evolving? Yeah, um, there is to some extent. So when we talk about our investment strategy, we think about in the near term, a recycling supply chain strategy that would include kind of the um, full cycle of, um, you know, recovery, recycling, processing, remanufacturing. And that's pretty well defined. And then you would have more uh, enabling solutions, longer term plays that would include um, digitization strategies that enable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, transparency or traceability through that type of supply chain. You would have um, uh, logistics. You would have alternative materials and, and new uh, chemical recycling uh, mm -hmm. solutions. So these are ways that we've defined it and have been included in the uh, uh, investment analysis that I mentioned earlier. But again, we don't yet have uh, a full taxonomy, if you will. And so we've been guided by what we know works in terms of investment opportunities for that fit our needs, but there's more to be done there for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's important that we talked about that because, you know, part of this whole 
anti-ESG movement or whatever, which I find a complete waste of my time anyway. Um, but um, part of the problem, I think, is that you know the whole the whole clean energy, energy transition, decarbonization, net zero. It's it's something relatively new. It's something that we were not really talking about it in this way ten years ago. So it needs to evolve. Um, and of course, you know my other point, which I make at almost every single episode, is that the train has all, has already left the station. So uh, whether you like it or not, you can choose to stand, you know, to stand at the station and watch the train go away. But um, and miss your opportunities, but uh, but but it's already it's already there. Um, sorry about the little soliloquy. Now, w- with all things net zero, decarbonization, etc. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's still the, the the fundamental or the starting point, I should say, is regulation and policy. So, gl- globally, which nations have a, a relatively solid regulatory framework in your personal view and which nations are likely to to put some sturdy ones in place soon and then um, and then then perhaps we can focus uh, so we'll talk about the the world first and then we can talk about maybe Asia specifically after that yeah terrific um it's an incredibly interesting topic Uh, the last five years has been very dynamic in the space uh, in plastics and circular economy and ocean plastic pollution space uh, just as it has been with uh, um, broad, more broadly car- uh, carbon and climate related policies. So ideally, in our world, you would see a holistic suite of policies and regulations that work in harmony, right, to incentivize reduction, management, recycling, circular economy. You know, it's like the SDG 12 icon and infinity loop of sustainable consumption and production. Um I have to say that I would not call out any single nation for having that in place today. Mm. But we've seen tremendous movement. And it is definitely clear that policies and even the anticipation of policies and regulations are playing a significant role in influencing the investment landscape. So there's no question about that. And I would say we see this in two ways. Um, One is specific to the plastic waste issue and and circular economy directly. And then the other is actually around ESG reporting requirements and disclosures, uh, which kind of, you know, is more contextual. So to dive a little bit deeper in the the first category, um, globally extended producer responsibility policies are having a big impact. So EPR, as they refer to it, requires that producers of difficult to manage waste materials have to contribute to responsible management of that waste and fit into a system, right? So this is really something that is has been for a long time bought by industry, but I think industry now understands that it's a key facet in how we pay for this overall ideal. And EPR has been a game changer in India where it's driven significant opportunities for waste management recycling infrastructure and private sector in that space. But it's also uh, created opportunities for digitization and traceability platforms. Enabling implementation of such policies is actually quite challenging, and anything that can facilitate that has an opportunity. So, So that's very clear. We've invested in seven companies across the value chain and in digitization in India. We've seen I would say significant tailwinds as a result of that policy. As the policy has evolved, our companies have to evolve right with, with it. So it's not just India. These policies are starting to be implemented in markets all around the world. And actually, the UN member states are currently negotiating an international legally binding instrument to address marine plastic pollution. Once they pass something, Mm-hmm. It will significantly accelerate the need for solutions at scale and investment opportunities as a result. So that's clear that that's one of them. The other is um, really more of the regulatory uh, shifts for reporting. And I would say the EU has had a, a tremendous effect. I expect that your uh, previous guests and uh, have talked a bit about the sustainable finance uh, taxonomy and framework that the EU has put out. Um, Singapore's adopted a similar one. But the role that that is playing is pretty interesting because it really increases the need for transparency 
and the newer corporate sustainability reporting directive is requiring corporations and investors to really disclose the basics of, of ESG, environmental issues, employees, and diversity, human rights, anti-corruption and bribery through the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be significant because for us, where we have, you know, those FMCG companies investing in us and also buying material from our portfolio companies, there needs to be some traceability there. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist today. How are we going to do that? There are lots of opportunities uh, from an investment perspective. And even in the voluntary space, I think CDP just announced this month a new plastics disclosure module mm -hmm. for reporting. Mm -hmm. And this type of standardized reporting will become increasingly relevant for the world's largest consumer brands, manufacturers, investors. Just to kind of like follow up on, on a couple of the things that you said, if we took a temperature gauge, Ellen, um, in, in Asia, in terms of which nations are more concerned or I've got an actual, some actual thinking, so maybe they don't have policies in place yet, but which countries have a little bit more concern or worry about, um, you know, things like like plastic and, and and other things related to the circular economy? Could do you have a kind of a feeling on which ones are more worried? Like, I mean, is Australia a little bit more noisy than others, for example? Mm. So I can speak to the markets that we are investing in specifically, and you know, in more earlier stage, high growth markets, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines. So in some of these markets, you would have, uh, actually in, in all of those in, in places like Vietnam as well, you have EPR in place or in development and not yet implemented. Mm -hmm. So there's still a big question, you know, Everyone knows it's coming, but what it's going to look like and what the implications will be in the local market, not yet clear. So that is a little bit of a barrier, honestly, to, you know, it's it's like where India was about four or five years ago. Mm, mm, mm. And then you also have interesting nuances as well. Indonesia has been very focused on just the marine pollution issue and the waste map side of things as a an archaic nation very very hard to uh create you know sort of harmonized or or um, centralized systems because you have to have solutions for every single island or every community in thailand you have a well-established petrochemical industry and a lot of infrastructure in place that is producing bio-based plastics. And so the context for our work in managing plastic waste and finding alternative solutions has to take into account that type of infrastructure, which is already there. So you have different flavors on that. Thailand also has created um, initiatives and incentives from a policy perspective that would incentivize those kinds of innovations as opposed to other markets that might focus more on just the core management infrastructure and that type of. Great, great. No, no, th th thank you for that. And I know we spent quite a bit of time on the on the background, but I think it's it's very important base to discuss yeah. the next point, which is the market landscape. So, um, what what are the business opportunities in the region when it comes to? the circular economy in your in your view? So Asia really presents quite a significant opportunity for both impact and returns in tackling ocean plastic. Uh, we know that there are opportunities across the value chain from infrastructure and downstream services to deal with the plastic that's already in the market to upstream solutions and innovations. It's why we invest across the region and we're also working on replicating our strategies elsewhere as well. In India, it's clear that investing um, across that value chain in a single market has positioned us for higher returns and bigger impact. So we invest in collections and sorting, we invest in recycling, manufacturing, digitization, and we know where material is coming from and going to and where there are gaps and opportunities. 
So this ecosystem approach allows us to de-risk investments. We invest in one part of that value chain. Here, we know if we invest in another part of the value chain, we can create synergies and optimize the capacity where it's needed most. We're looking at similar opportunities in Indonesia, in Thailand, and elsewhere in the region that have that similar kind of market level full value chain of portfolio. And it, I think this is part of our advantage to be able to do that where other investors might take a, you know, a single investment in one part of that chain, but not really fully have transparency and um, visibility into what happens upstream and downstream. Great. So you, you mentioned quite a few emerging markets. What about developed markets in Asia? Is, are there opportunities there or is that something that you, you don't necessarily look at? Our mandate as investors to address ocean plastic has really been to focus on specific emerging markets where infrastructure is under capacity. So our primary markets are India, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, and Malaysia. Um, we haven't invested in more developed markets in part because we are trying to play a more catalytic role where there isn't mm. easy option for mm. those who are building infrastructure. So looking at the capital markets landscape specifically, I don't know if you alluded to this earlier, but um, you know, how is the investor appetite? Is it solely just a philanthropic uh, investment or um, you know, what, what kind of institutions are we seeing there? Yeah, it's definitely not just philanthropy. So we are pursuing competitive financial returns. We do equity primarily, quasi-equity, convertible debt, um, but it's also taking advantage of blended finance. So in a single deal, we may be the lead investor, but we would also see uh, investment potentially earlier on from donor agencies, commercial bank loans, um, often government incentive grants, and also strategic corporate investors as well who are looking at the space. So that's typically uh, what it looks like to get deals done in our markets in the near term. But follow-on investment is a different story. I think there's a lot more opportunity and interest that we're seeing right now um, from more mainstream investors and financial institutions. Uh, we invested in a digitization solution in India called Recycle, K-A-L, um, in India that, uh, you know, it has received follow-on investment of, um, over $20 million from Morgan Stanley because of this sort of where they play in the ecosystem at this moment with implementation of policies and expansion of um, recycling infrastructure in the country. So, you know, one of our KPIs actually from an impact perspective is we're able to leverage for every dollar we invest. And I feel like this is something that we are starting to see good traction on. Although there isn't yet grow global recognition of the investment opportunities in the plastic circular economy, a significant and a significant financing gap remains. It's, it's coming and we're starting to see some different conversations than we had when we started four years ago. Uh, I see. So, so in general, you'd say that the A investor appetite is, is growing and number two, also the type of investor and investor profile is also uh, diversifying quite, quite, quite rapidly, and some institutions we may not have expected are actually appearing. Yeah, got it. So we, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we did start with those corporate investors as our first investors in our first fund, and subsequently, it's been encouraging to see the DFIs in particular join. Um, so we've had investment from European Investment Bank, IFC, for Parco. Uh, in our second fund in the last year because I think we've demonstrated that we can build a portfolio that is at a scale that has a ticket size that they can look at. Great. Well, it's, it's quite exciting to see that, um, you know, getting more investors, more, uh, diversified investors and more money into, into this space. Um, could you explain a little bit more about you know, circular capital's own um, strategies. Uh, I think you've got two strategies. One is 
the recycling of supply chain strategy and the disrupt strategy, which I kind of picked up from a website, sorry. <laughs> um, could you explain a little bit about that, please? Sure, yeah. So our recycling supply chain strategy is uh, kind of what I was talking about before, that the targets of the investment there are really about improving the recycling waste management supply chains so that we reach a scale to tackle the big challenges in South and Southeast Asia and have, being able to replicate their success. The disrupt strategy is more innovative technology forward. They represent kind of milestone leaps of progress more closely tied to um, direct decarbonization and climate impact. Uh, we get into uh, chemical recycling of hard to recycle materials. We get into alternative uh, plant-based uh, chemicals and uh, synthetic biology. And we feel like those deals are more about proving them out commercially and have great potential for technology transfer into Asia. So the two strategies are really designed to work together for a sustainable systems change across that plastics value chain over time. Um, those technologies and innovations are really going to take some time to develop and fully scale up. And in the meantime, we can't just wait for those. We have to be doing something as, as part of a transition. So that's why most of our pipeline is currently focused on companies that provide market-based solutions to plastic pollution post-consumption. But we're really looking for opportunities across that time frame and delivering financial and environmental value. At the same time, we have across those two strategies for focus on embedding inclusion and equity across the supply chains. So that is a lot about responsible sourcing and gender uh, and the management practices that we adopt as a firm as well as in through our investment process. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, in terms, in, in terms of um, you know investments and financial returns, how does your investment thesis links uh, or impacts with um, the financial returns? So I'm a firm believer in the ability of business models that create shared value. That is, you know, the core business is deriving financial returns because they are creating. So when we're screening potential investment opportunities, my team's filters are, does it have an impact on plastic waste? And does it make money? And then how does it make money? Because I want that connection to be very direct. So I tell my colleagues that I don't like to see trade-offs um, in the model or in the expansion plans because I know that if there's a conflict, they're not going to do it. Entrepreneurs are... And they fight to do the thing that has the biggest prize, and, mm -hmm. and they should. And uh, so it's important that these things are well aligned strategically and um, financially. So when we evaluate deals, we also look at the projected capital efficiency. So for us to have a sense of, you know, with each investment, how much plastic can we impact for the dollar in state. So I just got one quick follow-up question on that. Um, you know, there's been a lot of noise especially emanating out of the States, because I don't see as much noise out of Europe or Asia, where, you know, when you do impact investment, you obviously have to, that's what they say, obviously, sacrifice returns. When you approach investments in the circular economy, it, do you kind of shave off a little bit of returns because you're doing something, you know, positive for the world? or it would just be like any other investment uh, investment approach? So our, we're pursuing competitive financial returns. So our ocean fund targets a low teens return and the second fund, uh, which is a little bit different, is more like a, um, you know, kind of a little bit higher return. So it would be comparable to other private equity funds um, with similar Series C stage mm -hmm. companies, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's it's definitely we have uh, 
the ability to do that because of our investor relationships. We have also in our first fund a uh, loan guarantee from US DFC, mm. which allows us to de-risk some of the you know earlier stage or potentially like the ones in riskier markets. So that's critical to our ability to deliver on the returns, which we believe we have. And then we also do a lot of value add work on the back end once we've invested in portfolio management. Fantastic. So, so now, do you think that we could talk about some examples? There's a, there's a digital solutions company in, in India, you mentioned a couple of times, um, but could you give us perhaps a, a few examples so to put a little bit of color or what kind of investments we're talking about, what kind of company profiles we're talking about? Well, let me start with the disrupt strategy, actually. We invested in a circular fashion company called Cirque in 2021. Um, this is a uh, technology that's uniquely capable of separating recovering mixed textiles, so a polycot blend, and then actually turning that into two new uh, materials that can be then remanufactured into fabrics. So it's a truly circular solution for the fashion industry and for the textile economy, which is one of the most polluting uh, in the world. That, um, that deal, when we got in, it had an oversubscribed Series B raise of over $30 million US in July of 2022. And then the company actually just announced another $25 million in additional funding last month. So that one, both from a financial perspective and an impact potential perspective, is, is quite significant for us. They just announced a major partnership with Zara, the global retailer, which will provide textiles for a special fashion collection. It demonstrates the potential of the technology in the marketplace, and it really kind of, to my mind, brings that impact technology to scale very quickly because of those partnerships with the large um, corporations and brands. The, um, in the recycling supply chain strategy, we've also seen remarkable growth over the years. One of our very first investments was a sort of homegrown Indian recycler called Lucro. It specializes in recycling difficult to uh, recycle post-consumer flexible packaging. Uh, so plastic films and, and that sort of thing, and converts that material into uh, plastic granules, which are sort of the drop-in feedstock for lots of different uses, and as well as high value uh, and products as well. So they have a vertically integrated model. It's the whole value chain from collection to sorting and washing to chopping it up and, and melting it down and making it a product. Um, they have uh, had a fallen investment we made to them last year, which enabled the company to now triple its capacity and meet a fast-growing demand for its recycled products. And by the next six years or so, they expect to be recycling more than 300,000 tons of material and expanding livelihood opportunities for over 1,000 waste workers across India. And from my perspective, this one delivers on um, full value chain, uh, traceability. They, uh, we helped them build a software for traceability that's been now being used all the way through their system as well. Environmental, social, circular, and it's profitable. Mm, mm, mm. No, the, the, the very, very interesting examples. With regards to the first company, how many years had it been in existence? before you guys got, got into it? I mean, at what stage of development did, um, did you find that in company interesting? Right. It's an interesting question. Me personally, I actually knew this company when it was dealing with multi-layer plastic packaging back in 2018, I think I first mm, met them. Mm. So they've had a couple of shifts uh, with the technology, with the team, um, those pivots, I think, have actually taught them a lot, and they are in a, a great position now. So at, at the time that we invested, they were earlier stage, pre-commercial, but they had proved the concept, and um, they were running pilots and whatnot with a variety of customers. So this is 
maybe a little bit later stage than the very earliest lab stages or, or whatnot. No, very, very interesting case studies. So I guess, you know, we want to move to the last part of the conversation, which is your, your outlook, you know, final thoughts. And knowing that we're talking about, you know, net zero solutions, et cetera, we're not talking about your outlook for the rest of the year or this quarter, but really the long term, you know, over the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, is, you know, especially with regards to, to Asia. I mean, for example, if you were to guesstimate, and again, this is very, very long term um, outlook, uh, which, you know, countries are likely to put in some robust regulation in over the next few years, is one country going to be providing more opportunities than others, et cetera? Yeah. So I th I've always thought about this interplay, as I think you do too, between policy and regulations and private sector engagement and, and you know, the market sort of taking care of things. It's definitely an, inter, an, an interaction over time. And I see the policies coming. I think there will always be challenges with implementation, with monitoring mm -hmm. how the policies play out. But I see a lot of momentum there, which I'm quite excited about because I do see investment opportunity as a result for us and for our, our partners. The investment perspective, I think we still have to be pursuing opportunities. And I think we're also no longer alone in this space. The race to unlock the potential of the circular economy is definitely heating up. I think that we will see more connection as we have since the very beginning for Circulate, but with others as well of connecting climate and circular economy. And I think that that combination of the uh, policy action, public sentiment, corporate commitments that are being made in the space and multilateral engagement, it's creating a unique moment in time for investors uh, to prove that growth, competitive returns, impact for the circular economy, it all goes hand in hand. And I'm really optimistic. Mm, 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 mm. And if you were to pick, you know, one or two jurisdictions in the region, which you think are likely to advance a little bit more quickly than others, what would be your best guess, emphasis on best guess? So I think we are seeing a lot of maturity and opportunity, certainly in India, which I've discussed, uh, but also in Thailand. In India and Thailand, you would have an entrepreneurial ecosystem, an investment ecosystem that is conducive to an investor playing a role and also a plastics you know, regulatory environment and whatnot that really sets the stage for a circular economy. And those two things combined, I think, make for some really interesting opportunity. And you would have then on top of that, the likes of the World Bank and ADB, uh, UN uh, agencies, really also motivated to support. And that to me really is an exciting mix. And I would say in those two countries in particular, I, I think we have a lot of work to do there. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Hey, this is really, really great, Ellen. Um, any, any final thoughts or, or takeaways that you'd like to share? I am proud to say that Circulate Capital is demonstrating you can make money and have an impact in the plastic circular, circular economy in India. Um, we look forward to welcoming more investors and corporations on our journey to tackle ocean plastic while building a sustainable and inclusive circular. That's great. That's great. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to keep on being very, very, very busy. And, um, and that's good news for all of us. Absolutely all of us. Well, Alan, once again, thank you so much for your time. You've been you know, very, very generous with your time and I know you're busy and I really, really appreciate all of your insights. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Please contact us for any thoughts on topics or comments. 
Contact details are in the show notes. That the Asia Climate Finance Podcast is presented for educational purposes only. All information on the podcast must not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed by our guests are personal and may not represent those of current or previous employers.